Hello everyone and welcome to the Curious Mind podcast. My name is Gabriel Ellis. I'm a psychotherapist and Buddhist scholar. And in this podcast, I take deep dives into complex psychological topics that affect our well-being in general. Today I'm joined by Agnieszka Zizinska. She's an intimacy coach in Warsaw. And maybe you can start with you explaining a little bit what intimacy coaching is. Yeah, sure. Uh, so basically my job is uh, I help people to be sexually happy and fulfilled. And uh, the main parts of my job, I think, are uh, giving people the tools and uh, the skills that they need to build fulfilling uh, sex lives, intimate lives, relationship lives, and to help them on the way to kind of keep them on track, to ask the right questions, to help them raise awareness of what it is that they want and how to get it. Mm -hmm. And how do you work with people? I do uh, workshops that are like the educational side of my job. And I also work in the office. I, I do sessions for couples and uh, individuals. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks a lot. So I will provide a link to your website if anyone is interested to contact you either for the workshops or for individual work with you. Yes, thanks. Okay. So we have spoke. Uh, we have spoken uh, a lot. We have reflected on uh, our work. And one of the interesting topics that we regularly came across was that people come with their individual issues. Uh, but when we work with people, we regularly observe that these issues repeat themselves in a quite fascinatingly similar way. Yeah. And yet people, individuals or couples feel that this is very much their own personal issue and that they have no idea that those uh, problems occur in a very similar way with other people as well mm -hmm. yeah i feel like in 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 the area of sex especially this is maybe even more profound because sex is such a taboo topic hmm. so you rarely get the chance to hear what other people's stories are and see that you're not alone with your problems yes so just very generally i guess this is something that occurs in workshops very that, much mm -hmm. yeah yeah so Group spaces, especially, are those spaces where you can find out that you're not alone. Mm -hmm. So when we're able to create a safe space to talk about sexuality, to, to talk about how we experience sexuality and relationships, intimate relationships, this is when you, you like, usually it, it will come up that our stories are very similar in some ways. Of course, we find differences as well, but I, I regularly am delighted to see the the look in people's eyes when they find out that this is not something that makes them weird what happened to them what they feel what they think is not weird is not unusual it's more typical than they would ever think mm -hmm. yes uh, one of these areas where those similarities occur is uh, in the field of gender we both work with men and women and they s seem to have very specific issues that are yet common to men more in general and women more in general. Could yeah. you reflect a bit about that? Yeah, so many women that I work with um, feel that their experience of um, a certain kind of disempowerment is a personal flaw. Mm -hmm. So when they come into my office for individual coaching, they will usually tell a story of... Um, Mm, lack of knowledge of oneself, of a deficiency in understanding their own needs. And they will, this story will usually be framed as a personal failure. So I failed to learn about myself. I failed to know myself well, to prioritize myself well. Mm -hmm. And then um, if you do enter a group space or if, if, if we have the occasion where, where I can share this information with a client that this is a common experience and that this is not this this we may think of this not as a personal failure but as an outcome of a larger scheme of things I would say mm -hmm. and look for reasons for why this happened uh, in a certain way this can be quite empowering yeah 
So um, to make it a little bit more concrete, an example would be that you have some sort of a client and um, she would complain that she doesn't know exactly who she is as a person or as a sexual being or how to establish herself in the relationship a little bit more actively. And then she would come with a question of, okay, how to give me tools. How do yes. I do that as an individual? How do I overcome my individual issues in that respect? So what is the change in the perspective when we add that this is something that is shared among several women? What does it change? Well, I feel like it, it releases the shame of failure. Mm -hmm. It releases the kind of, I need to beat myself up first. Before I make any changes, I need to punish myself for not doing enough until now. And when you see you're not alone, when you see that this is an issue that an issue that many women deal with, then I feel like you you, you are more willing to uh, forgive yourself for finding yourself in this situation. Mm -hmm. And maybe this opens a door to make changes uh, easier, faster and to not self punish for the perceived failure. Mm -hmm. So. I find it uh, easier then to build skills such as saying no, such as uh, deciding what it is that I don't want to do sexually, what it is that I do want to do sexually, because suddenly the fact that I haven't until now answered these questions for myself is no longer something that I have to make penance for. Mm -hmm. Yes. And to me, from a psychological perspective, uh, the interesting process that happens here is that what seemed to me first an individual issue and the pressure to s resolve this individual issue puts a lot of pressure on yeah. me. And when I gain the understanding that there is something more systemic going on, that this is something that's shared by many people and is an issue of society, partly, um, that this opens up a different space. Yeah. And that part of this pressure is removed and I develop some curiosities like, huh, how is that connected? Why are there other women who go through a very similar experience? By all means, not everyone, of course. So we talk about trends. That does not mean that everyone is, in, is sharing the same issues. Mm -hmm. We know that. But uh, by the change in this perspective, I become more curious and um, I still have this goal of developing myself but psychologically there's suddenly more room um, more uh, understanding myself forgiving myself for not having been able to resolve that until now mm -hmm. um, maybe becoming more interested in talking to other women exchanging idea maybe researching on the internet a little bit more uh, so i guess psychologically these are circumstances or conditions that make it much more likely that I allow myself to experiment to um, uh, tackle some topics more directly to talk to my partner more openly when not all the pressure is on me to resolve it mm -hmm. yeah I feel like there's less self-blame hmm. and uh, suddenly you can see the the potential for empowerment for mm -hmm. self-empowerment because if, if it is not entirely your fault that this hasn't happened until now, then perhaps you do have the potential. Perhaps you are not a person who is incapable of knowing their own needs or expressing them or being sexually happy. Perhaps it's just something that you have potential for, but this potential hasn't been kind of out in the open yet, you know? Mm -hmm. Yes. So if one of the typical issues uh, for women would be the disempowerment, what is the counter side from the male side? What what are the repeating stories there that they don't seem to be able to solve and that has a systemic aspect? Well, I feel like most of the stories that I hear from men are mainly about the complete lack of uh, spaces to express uh, their sexuality, their experience of sexuality with others. While women do talk about sex more, I feel, amongst themselves mm -hmm. in, in female groups, the, the men that I hear, they very often talk about uh, only talking about sex uh, when there is alcohol involved and in a way which is a very jokey, a very light, uh, a very kind of detached kind of way. 
Mm-hmm. So for many men, I feel like the, the biggest change happens when they, sometimes for the first time in their entire lives as grown-up men, experience a conversation about sex and sexuality in a safe space mm-hmm. where they are not judged, where they are not evaluated for their performance, where they can express themselves without fear of punishment. Mm-hmm. And I feel like that's the biggest kind of breaking point. So even just not, not even yet the 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 empowerment, the taking charge of oneself, but just finding oneself in a space that seemed completely impossible. Mm-hmm. But how is that different to the similarity with women? Because women also struggle to find their place in this kind of conversation. What is what are the differences there? The typical differences between men and women. Well, what I'm observing is that um, women are freer to be vulnerable with each other, Hmm. while uh, men often talk about um, their inability to to form relationships with other men that would enable this kind of safe conversation. Mm -hmm. So I hear a lot of stories about bragging. I hear a lot of stories about... uh, sharing stories of conquests and the men that i meet i'm sure this is a select group this is not representative statistically uh, in any way but the stories that i hear are the stories of i never believed what 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 my male friends would tell me about their sex lives you just know that we're just not sharing stories but we're not really taking it seriously yes so I feel like this, this, the, the, the difference between how the genders express themselves, how, how they um, find spaces to express themselves is, is mainly, even though many women have the experience of disempowerment, they may often talk about this disempowerment. Mm-hmm. They may share the story of what's not working. They may share the story of being unhappy, being in pain various elements of their reproductive rights and uh, their sex lives may be shared uh, while with men i often find this is simply not possible yes and um, to again uh, build the connection to the systemic aspect that is surely connected with the way that still boys are raised and the image of men in general uh, which means that they have to be in control, they have to be in power, they have to take charge, hence the bragging, uh, and also the difficulty to talk about emotions because often enough still we have the perception that uh, talking about emotions means weakness. Yeah. And uh, as men, it's frowned upon to show that you're weak uh, and Hence, as a consequence, I rather don't touch the topic of emotions. And hence, again, a regular complaint of uh, female partners that their male partners don't talk to them about emotions. That's a classic kind of complaint that many men just simply don't know what it means. So my wife, my girlfriend, my partner wants me to talk about feelings. I don't know what the hell that means. Mm. I don't know what she wants. I can talk about stuff, but that doesn't make me feel close in the relationship. So for many men, it feels very artificial and a kind of a female thing to do. And it's still just an alienating um, approach. And sexuality is embedded in this. uh, Talking about sexuality is embedded in this difficulty for many men to talk about emotions or to know what it means Mm -hmm. at all. And that creates a divide then between the partners. Yeah, I feel like yeah, the the the, the running uh, theme is also vulnerability here. Mm-hmm. Like I I feel that many women have much more access to vulnerability, just because of the systemic differences, just because of just the sheer physical power that you either have or don't have. And the, the experience of vulnerability is much more accessible to women. Yeah. And talking about something that intimate uh, or that taboo, for that matter, as uh, your sex life is intrinsically vulnerable. Like, 
there is no way around it even with lots of skills and lots of knowledge you're still sharing very intimate parts of you when you talk about sex Mm -hmm. so i feel like there is there is this vulnerability divide yes uh before we come to maybe some concrete um tips or approaches uh let's collect maybe some other topics that seem to play into the bedroom situation and where people feel it's the individual issues but in fact it's very common with other people as well so one thing uh, in the conversations that we've had before uh, and on that we agree is the idea of performance that sexuality is a field where i have to prove my skills and i have to be good that there is uh, a lot of expectation of what good sex is yeah and um I guess that many people already have the understanding that a lot of pressure is just a, a killer, a sex killer, or it destroys my lust, or it um, prevents me to truly enjoy the intimacy. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I feel like th- this is this is a um, like a, a very wide kind of theme because for me, performance means how you do things. So. Are you doing things well enough? That's mm-hmm. one thing. But also what you do. Yeah. What you do in bed is actually also one of the things that are somehow uh, influenced by performance standards. So uh, many people that I come across in my practice have never really made decisions about what kinds of sex acts they are actually going to uh, engage in because somehow throughout their lives it was just a given. It's a given that you do some kissing. It's a given that you take off your clothes most of the time. It's a given that the bodies touch each other. It's a given that there's something to do with the genitals at some point, touching or mouth, genital, uh, some kind of uh, involvement. Hmm. And then you go to penetrative sex and then you orgasm at least one person. So these what we can call scripts, that there is script of even men know that The woman supposedly expects some sort of foreplay. So, okay, let's go through the motion of two minutes foreplay. That's certainly enough. She had her fill. Now let me go to the part that is satisfying for me, which is the penetration. Um, When it comes to oral sex, there's a lot of ideas of how it should be done. Yeah. And the idea is like, oh, this is, I have to perfect my technique of Mm. oral sex. Uh, and certainly my partner wants that in this way because I've seen it in a video a woman told me or I saw it in a video how a woman said that she wants oral sex to be performed and since it's probably all the same Mm -hmm. let me try to copy it as well as possible and she must be satisfied with that no need to talk about it Mm -hmm. so that my main focal point my orientation point is not what I discussed with my partner but some sort of script that I clumsily acquired somewhere. Be yeah. it when we were kids, we were reading some magazines, the Bravo or something. This was the source of the script back then. And we understood like, oh, this is how it's to be done. Yeah. Not by talking to my partner, but by reading the correct, the best source, mm-hmm. finding the best book uh, that describes the technique yeah. and so on. So again, I avoid the uncertainty of the communication i avoid to be make myself vulnerable and asking maybe admitting or experiencing that i did something wrong in the past i skip all that and uh, i take recourse i take uh, refuge uh, in some skill again that Mm -hmm. i think i acquired and then both avoid the discomfort of talking about it and negotiating and really describing my specific need Mm. Yeah, yeah, and like it, it still surprises me how 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 pervasive and how how kind of tenacious this um, this sexual script is, mm-hmm. because with every like with the culture of individualization that we have now, with like you know tailor made services and custom made products, mm-hmm. we still assume that all people want the same kind of oral sex. We yes. still assume that. Uh, penis always likes the same things and uh, we always kind of assume that this is that there there is a magic wand kind of solution 
Yeah. That is still surprising to me how 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 we are able to juggle this individualized kind of uh, cultural message with when it comes to sex this overreaching assumption that everyone has it the same way. Mm-hmm. Yes. Uh, let's maybe collect some of those popular scripts that are out there. So what about foreplay, for example? What is your experience in kind of typical understandings that women have and men have and where they fall short, these scripts, and don't actually represent the reality that you know from your experience in workshops and working with people? So a common understanding is that, um, that women want a lot of foreplay and men don't. Right, so this would be true. You know, the common idea. How is it in reality? What what is the kind of the vi- range of variation that you, as far as you have experience with people? Well, I, I would start by saying that uh, one thing we could do is stop and think about the 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 very idea of foreplay and mm-hmm. the word foreplay, foreplay, which means something that happens before you play, something that happens before the main event. And already at this point, I, I would encourage couples to think over the how, how they approach foreplay. Is it something that has the function of leading up to the real thing, the actual thing? And if so, are we allowing ourselves to kind of diminish this experience, to diminish its importance? It's just an appetizer. Mm-hmm. So sometimes what I offer is a perspective where you make foreplay or whatever you want to call it at this point uh, the main course Mm -hmm. the main dish and then you can really dig your fingers into this and make the most out of this experience Uh, and that's that that's that's a genderless issue i feel when we do come to gender differences as you said uh, i do have the experience that many people regardless of gender believe that foreplay is for women yes and of course, many women love foreplay. Many many women enjoy foreplay or need it in order to get their bodies in, in the aroused state that will enable them to want something more. Uh, but many women also talk to me about really liking just doing it straight away, mm-hmm. just foregoing all the foreplay, not having to, you know, devote 20 more minutes to the whole thing and just being very quick and uh, kind of fast and um, hard about it, like more of a hardcore kind of script turned yes. on. Yes. That happens. And uh, many men talk about really wanting to be sensual and erotic and mm. try things out and uh, kind of explore various sensations and a variety of activities that you can do at this point. Mm. So I'm seeing both men and women who do not uh, kind of um, do not fall into the, the, the more, 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 most statistically common category. Yes. So there's a good example, I feel, where uh, which shows that the script stands in our way. So the script that actual sex is something very specific, usually uh, penetration and intercourse, and everything else is whatever, a prelude or an after game or something like that, but not the real thing. So this is a common perce- perception. This is a script. And what it does is that it masks all the differences that there are between certain people or that we are in certain moods, um, that we have different needs in different times of day, on different days, in different situations in life. It masks all that and it reduces all those differences. Um, So even if I forget, even if I try to adjust the script, so if my idea was, okay, so let's find out if my girlfriend, um, how much foreplay she likes let me adjust my script it would still be a mistake because i would um undervalue that sometimes she's in a different mood and sometimes she has different needs just as i have different needs in certain situation so we can basically come to one of the standard solutions that are necessary here which is obvious that i have to check again and again what are we doing today what are your needs today what would you like together to do together mm-hmm. today? Because I simply have no way of telling 
what my partner wants. There's so much variety. Yeah. And, and I feel like this is often a point where many of my clients get stuck. Mm -hmm. Because when I say, well, just talk to each other as you're having sex, just check in with each other. And this is an experience that many people don't want to have. They yeah. don't want the magic to fade away for a moment. They don't want to be in their heads. They want to be in their bodies. And uh, the, the whole uh, conversation around consent and ongoing consent and saying yes and checking for a no is, I think, bumps against our, our ideal of like a romanticized, mm. passionate kind of, I'm reading your mind right now, I know everything that you want. Yes. And what I usually say is, no, you do not need to check in every five seconds. No, mm. especially if this is a stable partner, you probably know each other quite well, and you, you can make assumptions. It's not about treating the other person as a blank page every time you have sex with them, but just the ability to kind of jump into the conversation when necessary, mm -hmm. I feel, is th my main point that I usually try to make. It's not about keeping the conversation going the entire time. It's about the ability to say something once you really feel it's necessary. Yes. Right? Like when you feel that you want to do something differently or when you feel a vibe from your partner and you're not entirely sure how to interpret it this is the moment to ask a short question mm -hmm. to have the ability to exchange information at that point yes uh, and i would go back to what you said in the beginning of this topic which is we have again a certain understanding of what sex and especially good sex is good sex is so the script when we don't talk and we have a magical connection that lets me know exactly what my partner wants or that somehow transmits what I want to my partner and somehow magically both do the exact same thing and potentially also have the orgasm together. Mm -hmm. This is a very common uh, romantic script, yeah, uh, which is also connected to... Um, having found my soulmate, right? This plays into that, that there is a magical connection. All these different ideas and scripts, uh, as if they are very creative in order to not to make us talk <laughs> to each other. So let, us, let me find my soulmate because then I don't have to talk to them mm -hmm. and express my specific needs in that situation. Let's have sex in a specific way uh, so that we don't have to talk. Which is, I guess the listeners can see the pattern there, right? So this is exactly kind of those societal scripts that are linked to very um, concrete kind of models of how things should be. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. And I'm like, why wouldn't you want to talk to your soulmate? Talk mm -hmm. to your soulmate. You may also find out that they like something that is happening. You might get a yes. It's the no that people are usually afraid of getting. Yes. What if I ask a question and the answer is no? What if you ask the question and the answer is yes? Wouldn't that be amazing? Mm -hmm. Now, what is the learning curve in that, uh, in the couples or the individuals that you have been coaching? Um, because especially uh, in both our experiences, when we question those scripts, being in a psychotherapeutic context or an intimacy coaching context, it is weird. One of those, one advantage of scripts is they're very repetitive. I don't have to reinvent myself. Yeah. I know basically what is going on. It gives me security and stability. So when you encourage people to talk, for example, on sex and to express their needs, it must be awkward in the beginning and they must feel lost and not to know exactly how to do it. Is this the way that I, is that okay that I said it like this? Mm -hmm. All these insecurities. Um, does it stop? Is it always awkward? What is the learning curve there? Well, I feel like the, the biggest bump in the road is the one that comes first. So just the experience of expressing something verbally that hasn't been expressed before is the biggest bump. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, however, this is a bump that we can usually look after quite well. We don't try to remove it, but I would rather call it looking after this bump. So. Oh. Uh, what I usually do is I uh, do an exercise with a couple in session, so while they're with me mm -hmm. to um, kind of facilitate the process. And I would ask them, for example, to write down five sentences that describe something that they like mm -hmm. uh, and that they appreciate about their sexual relationship with their partner. So start from the good stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, then I would ask them to read it out no follow-up, no conversation, no need to respond in any way, just to read it out, look into their eyes and say what you like. Is it already difficult for people to do? It sometimes is difficult to do, mm -hmm. yes, because that is already self-expression. Yes. Even though there is no fear of punishment, there is no fear of the response, because we are not responding, we're just listening and saying thank you at the end, that's it. Mm -hmm. uh, that may already be difficult just for the sheer fact that perhaps this is the first time in their lives when they are expressing something intentionally to, mm -hmm. to their partner about themselves and how they experience the sexual relationship. Yes. And there I can imagine that there is a potential for a lot of awkwardness. So, for example, if I tell my partner for the first time, this is what I like. I like when you kiss me on my neck. I like when you perform certain sexual activities in this way, because then the implication is like, why haven't you told me for the last five mm. years? Yeah. And then there's a lot of shame and kind of blaming my partner. You kind of consciously let me do wrong things all the time. How could you? So I can imagine that it's not just awkwardness, but it can lead to friction and blaming. Mm. Yeah, yeah, that is possible. And that's why I, I usually try to preface uh, an exercise like this with a, a sort of like a creation of a safe, safe, safe space where mm -hmm. it can happen. So what I will usually say is, please be mindful of what, what, it, what you're feeling when you're hearing the sentences. If uh, something is coming up for you, something about the past or something about the present or future, let's let's leave it there. Let's let it exist and leave it there for a bit. And in a moment, we will get, get back to this. Yes. So what I try to do is I try to kind of um, make a container for the positive expressions mm -hmm. and then to open another container to look at all the things that were born through this experience and to deal with them. Yes. Um, this is also connected, I, I think, to a larger topic in relationships um, because we can have a similar dynamic in many other fields as well. So when one partner decides where to go on vacation, right, and then during um, a couple therapy or when a couple decides to speak their mind more freely after a couple of years, the other partner says, well, I never wanted to go to Spain. I hated it. Mm -hmm. I would have liked to go to Scandinavia. And then again, the same dynamic can occur when someone says, why didn't you tell me? So the ability to speak my mind and to express my needs uh, in the relationship, some years in the relationship, uh, is connected to the general topic of expressing one needs, one's needs in the relationship. One question that I have here is, um, is it strictly connected to you? So do couples that have a good way of communicating in daily life about what activities that they like to do, vacation, how to raise children, do you think that these couples uh, have a better chance to communicate also uh, regarding the sex life or is the sex life a very distinct animal in itself mm. i feel like i'm sure that couples who have good communication strategies in their everyday lives are at a better starting point mm -hmm. if they want to improve their communication around the uh, issue of sex and sexuality but i am perpetually surprised by how distinct uh, the sexuality area is. Mm -hmm. And I have met many couples that came into my office and that started talking to me in a way which made me think like, wow, these people are amazing. They love each other so much. They're affectionate. They compliment each other. They, there's so much good here. This is awesome. This is amazing. Mm -hmm. And then we start talking about sex and it turns out there's a wall. 
there's just a wall and those skills this like those skills say this is not what i'm here for no you're not going to be applying me in this context this is taboo you don't do that yes (laughs) and then i mean this is this is a context which i like to work with because that's a lot of resources that we just have to move past the wall (laughs) or create the wall a a hole (laughs) in the wall and move the skills but Somehow, I do have the impression that those skills sometimes refuse to just be applied to sex. Mm -hmm. Yes, Um, I can agree. And I see many similarities to my work. So, for example, uh, many people are good in communication at the workplace. Mm. Um, They are professional. They keep their temper when a difficult topic comes up. They have learned some skills of resolving issues conflicts, compromising, and so on. And then they go home and suddenly one small gesture by the partner, one hint, one wrong word, and I'm turned off, Uh, I'm annoyed. It leads to arguments or to distance. And people very quickly decide not to talk to each other or not to open up anymore. Uh, It makes my work a little bit easier because it just requires for them to see that they have these skills. It would be horrible if they wouldn't have these skills in general and people who don't have them in any field of life have it much, much harder. But they, again, like you said, they have failed to somehow make a transfer, transference from areas of life where they have skills to their relationship. And unfortunately, it is just as it is that uh, we often treat the people closest to us in the least effective way or the least beneficial way. So it's common that uh, we treat our colleagues uh, kind of well Mm. and professionally and and with circumvision Uh, and then close friends, family, partners, children um, suffer more from my lack of applying the skills that I know to their relationship. So I I see a connection there also to sexuality and the sex life. And I I feel like this may have something to do with just how codependent we're feeling in those relationships. Mm -hmm. Can Uh, you explain what that means? Well, what I mean by this is if if I have a disagreement with a co-worker, it's probably going to be unpleasant, but maybe it's not going to completely destroy my self-esteem for the day. Mm -hmm. If I have a disagreement with my partner about something that I felt was very clear for years and I was under the impression that we both wanted to go to Spain and then it turns out my partner didn't, this destroys a certain image of the relationship that I had, of myself in this relationship that I had, Mm -hmm. and it touches a much more, I feel like a deeper part of me in some sense. So the fact that I'm close to this person and that what this person says, what this person feels influences me and my images of myself Mm -hmm. makes the whole dynamic a much more vulnerable one. Again, that word. So in sex, I feel like this is yet another step inside. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because that's not Spain. That's not holidays. That's Mm -hmm. who I am. Yeah. Right. And that's very intimate. That's my insides. Yes. So a rejection of my body or rejection of my desires or fantasies hits home very quickly and um, is very capable of to make me withdraw, maybe not just for the night, but to leave a dent there permanently or for a long time. So. Yeah, exactly. So uh, I I don't find it surprising that these are the areas of our lives that we have a lot of defenses in because Mm -hmm. we don't want those images of ourselves destroyed. We've worked for them. We've 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 constructed them. And so we don't want to let that go. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. thank you so far for the conversation. We could go on for a long time and could go into detail, but maybe you could share uh, what kind of approach or suggestion seem to have uh, benefited many of the people that you have worked with something for the audience to uh, quickly apply or a suggestion that they could take to heart well i i feel like the the best progression is if you want to make your uh, sex life with your partner better start with yourself So I would say take a piece of paper and write down 10 things that are important to you in your sex life. 
Mm. And then think about which of those you want to share with your partner, which of those are priorities for you, which of those you might want to devote more attention to than until now, and go step by step. Don't flood your partner with 10, choose one. Mm. Ask them to do the same and ask whether they are willing and ready and wanting to share something like this with you. Mm-hmm. and exchange one piece of information at a time. <laughs> yes. Well, not just from your work, you are no stranger to these kinds of tools and approaches. You have recently also published a book. That's right, yes. It's in Polish, but can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, so my idea was to have a collection of uh, the pieces of information, the the tools, the skills that I found the most universally applicable mm-hmm. Uh, the most universally appreciated among my clients. Uh, So it's 10 chapters that give you 10 different themes, like your sexual self, expressing needs, and saying yes and no, sexual fantasies, etc. And then for each of those chapters, uh, you have seven uh, exercise uh, suggestions, Mm -hmm. which is exactly this approach of take a piece of paper, write it down, think about it, (laughs) communicate it. So uh, this this sort of self-reflection, which is uh, then hopefully going to open up some doors if you do have a partner that you want to open doors with. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you very much. As I mentioned at the beginning, I will leave a link to your website and to the book. Uh, in the uh, description of the podcast. Thank you very much, Agnieszka. Thank you for having me. That's it for today. Thanks, everyone, for listening. Feel free to leave a comment. And if you enjoyed it, tune in to another episode on this channel. Below, you can also find a link to my website, elliscounseling.com, and my Facebook page, Ellis Counseling and Psychotherapy, where you can contact me for online therapy or counseling sessions.